Islam 101. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu wa ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Mishahidun al-kiram, respected viewers, brothers and sisters, nurahi bubikum. We welcome all of you to a new segment and a new episode of Islam 101. We were teaching the fundamentals and the basics of the religion of Islam. And today we're going to deal with another critical and extremely important issue, which is the Sunnah in Al Islam. What is the Sunnah? What is the meaning of the Sunnah? When we say the Quran and the Sunnah, what do we mean by the Sunnah? We've already dealt with certain aspects of the Quran and the tafsir of the Quran. And inshallah, we'll continue on that path. But today we want to divert the issue a little bit by bringing the second source of legislative abilities in this religion, dealing with the Sunnah. The Sunnah in the language of the Arabs, it simply means a tariqa, a way, a path in which someone is going to do something. But as it relates to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sunnah means multiple things. So the person has to know who is doing the talking. Is the one who's talking about the sunnah from the jurists, the fuqaha of al-Islam? Or is he from the muhaddithin, those people who are the scholars of al-hadith? Or is he from the usuliyin, those people who deal with usul al-fiqh? Because all of them have different interpretations of the sunnah. We don't want to confuse the issue, but it's really simple. The sunnah really means the statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his actions, and those things that were done in his presence. And he saw it being done, and he gave his consent by either being quiet, by smiling at it, by saying it was okay, or by asking the people to give me a part of that thing that you did. So those three things constitute the sunnah of Abul Qasim, Rasulullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it is. The statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like he said in authentic hadith, Raka'at al-Fajr, khayru min al-dunya wa ma fiha. The two raka'at, the two prostrations, the two raka'at that a person prays before he prays the morning prayer, the sunnah prayer, they are better than the dunya and what is in the dunya. So to pray those two raka'at are the sunnah because it's from his statement and he encouraged the people to do it. So that's an example of his statement. As an example of his actions, Aisha radiyallahu anha, she said, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُسَلِّي رَكَعَتَيْنْ خَفِيفَتَيْنْ قَبْلْ صَلَاةِ الْفَجْرِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray two short, light rakat before the fajr prayer. So that's an example of him actually praying that particular prayer. And number three, an example of the prayer being made, and he allowed it to be done. He sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam prayed the obligatory fajr prayer, the morning prayer with the group of Muslims in congregation. After the prayer, Rasulullah was exiting the masjid. He was leaving the masjid to see a man praying by himself. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he waited until the man finished the prayer. He asked the man, Aju'ilat al-fajr arba raka'at? Has the morning prayer been made to be four rakat? I prayed two. Now you're praying two more? The man said, no, Ya Rasulullah. But when I came to the masjid, I never made the two rakats before the obligatory prayer. So now I'm praying them now after you completed your prayer. And Rasulullah Sallallahu remained silent and he left the masjid. So the sunnah in this case is that the man prayed the two rakat of al-fajr that we're supposed to make. Before the obligatory prayer, he prayed them after the Fajr prayer, which goes to show that part of the Sunnah is praying those two rakats if you miss it after the Fajr prayer. So that's the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the definition. So the Sunnah, once again, consists of three things. The statements of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the actions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and those things that were done in his presence, and he gave his consent by remaining silent, by smiling, by saying it's okay. Those three things are the sunnah. Also, the sunnah are those things that are opposite of what is an obligation. That's to the fuqaha of al-Islam, the Islamic jurists. The 
Fajr prayer is an obligation. But the two rakat that you pray before Fajr is not an obligation. It's the sunnah. So the sunnah can be the opposite of what is an obligation. You don't have to do that. That's the sunnah. But you must do this. This is an obligation. That's the meaning of the sunnah as well. So the sunnah has multiple meanings. The sunnah also can mean the aqidah or the ideology and the minhaj, the methodology that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought. Right now, the Muslims, we want to return al-Islam to its former place of supremacy in the earth. We want the ana, the izza, and the power and the might to return back to the Muslims. Well, there's a way of the sunnah as well. So the sunnah has multiple meanings. The sunnah also can mean the aqidah or the ideology and the minhaj, the methodology that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought. Right now, the Muslims, we want to return al-Islam to its former place of supremacy in the earth. We want the ana, the izzah, and the power and the might to return back to the Muslims. Well, there's a way of going about accomplishing that. We have to accomplish it according to the sunnah, and we have to be from ahl sunnah. The sunnah in this case means the correct ideology, believing in Allah correctly, and also the correct methodology in that we go about bringing the, the Islamic State into existence the correct way or adding on to our strength the way Rasulullah and his companions did, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. As it relates to that last aspect of the sunnah, the scholars of al-Islam, they used to write books like Al-Imam Ahmed wrote his book, Usulu Sunnah, the fundamentals of the sunnah. And in that book, he's talking about the aqidah, the ideology and the methodology that's correct of al-Islam. His son, Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal, also wrote a book, Kitab al-Sunnah. And in his book, the book of the Sunnah, Kitab al-Sunnah, Abdullah ibn Ahmed ibn Hanbal, he wrote about the issues of what we believe in, what is correct for the Muslim to believe as it relates to Allah and other than that. And we have a lot of books like that the scholars of al-Islam wrote. Sharh al-Sunnah by Imam al-Barbahari and other than that. So those are the definitions of the Sunnah. The most important definition as it relates to what we're dealing with here today is the Sunnah that consists of three things. The statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those things that he said. The things that he did and what was done in his presence and he allowed it to be done. There is a misconception as it relates to the sunnah that many people have and want to clear up this misconception. Some people believe if the thing or the particular issue is not in the Quran, then it is from the sunnah. And it's up to you. You have a choice. You can leave it or you can do it. It's up to you. And as I said, this is a misconception because the sunnah, the things that come in the sunnah, the authentic hadith, the practices of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his statements, some of his statements are an obligation and some of his statements are not an obligation. And that's why we have to get knowledge of the religion. Let not anyone think from amongst the Muslims or other than the Muslims that if Rasulullah said it and it's coming from him, then it's only the sunnah. No, there are things that he said that are an obligation upon us to follow. He prophesied and told us that the Muslims are going to suffer from a lot of differing and a lot of infighting. So he gave us some advice as to what we can do to be saved. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala ali wa sallam, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al khulafa al rashidin al mahdi min badi. Abdu alayha bin nawajid. When the time comes, when the Muslims are disagreeing amongst themselves, they're fighting each other. There's a lot of conflict with the Muslims amongst themselves, not dealing with the kuffar, amongst themselves. He said, I advise you to take my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa or leaders of al-Islam after him. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, may Allah be pleased with all of them. So that hadith helps us to understand that during the time of trials and tribulations, it is not up to you. If you want to do it, you can do it. If you want to leave it, you can leave it. And you call that the sunnah? No. It's an obligation for us to leave off that which is going to lead to more trials and tribulations. And it's an obligation upon us to eradicate and to get rid of all of those issues 
that are causing the ikhtilaf or the points of differences to remain between the Muslims. He also says, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Man raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Whoever rejects my sunnah, he's not from me. And this is not talking about the one who rejects and he doesn't do the prayer that's not an obligation. Because if a person chooses not to do a prayer that's not an obligation, no one can blame him. The man came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, if I make halal halal, and I made what's haram haram, meaning those things that Allah said are halal, those things that he said are haram, I treat them as halal and haram, permissible and impermissible. And if I pray the five daily prayers and I fast in the month of Ramadan, and that's all I do, will I go to Jannah? Rasulullah said, yes, you will be successful. The man said, Wallahi, I speak about Allah. That's all I'm going to do. Then the man left. Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after he turned around, Qad aflaha in sadaqa. If that man does what he said he's going to do, he's going to be successful. So he said, I swear that all I'm going to make is the five daily prayers. I'm not going to make the two rakahs before Fajr, the two or four rakahs before Dhuhr, the two or four after Dhuhr. I'm not going to make Witr. He swore all I'm going to do is I'm going to do the five daily prayers. And I'm only going to fast the month of Ramadan. I'm not going to fast Mondays or Thursdays, which is the Sunnah. I'm not going to fast the middle of the month, which is the Sunnah. I'm not going to fast on the day of Arafat, which is the Sunnah. The six days of Shawwal, which is the Sunnah. So no one should understand that the Sunnah is only what Rasulullah said. But what Allah said is an obligation. There are things from the Sunnah that are an obligation upon every Muslim to follow. And to be against the sunnah, not to practice these things, which is an obligation, can lead a person to destruction. Allah told us in the Quran as a warning, let those people know who go against the command of Rasulullah, let them know that they may be afflicted with a serious fitna, which is shirk and kufr, disbelief, or that they may be afflicted with a grievous punishment. Why would Allah Azawajal, Allah the Most High, Allah the Most Great, why would he punish someone simply because the person didn't want to do something that was not an obligation upon him? If that was true and that was the case, then the vast majority of Muslims will be setting themselves up to get punished because most of the Muslims are not holding on to that aspect of the sunnah, the forms of worship that are additional from the sunnah prayers and the sunnah fast. So what Rasulullah said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from it is that which is from the sunnah and it's an obligation. And from some of the things that he said is that which is from the sunnah, but it is not an obligation. As it relates to the sunnah in general, whether it is the sunnah that is an obligation or whether it is a sunnah that is not an obligation, whatever the case is, the Muslim is encouraged. The Muslim is commanded. The Muslim has to be from the person of the sunnah. How many hadith do we have where the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man la yutir falaysa minna. Whoever doesn't make the witr, he's not from us. Meaning, he's not from those people who will be raised up Yom al Qiyamah who did the witr prayer. And they will be from the people who love the sunnah, honored the sunnah, held on to the sunnah. No, we have to do our best to try to bring life to the sunnah, to spread the sunnah to teach the sunnah. We have to do that. That's a part of our religion. And in addition to that, we have to look at the sunnah as being a source that will save us during the times of trials and tribulations and during our lifespan here on this earth. The great Imam of Al-Islam, Al-Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Al-Imam Malik used to say about the sunnah, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is similar to the ark of Noah. The sunnah of Rasulullah is similar to Noah's ark. Whoever gets on it and he rides it, he'll be successful. Because when the winds of adversity and the waves of fitna and hawa, the waves of trials and tribulations, when they're blowing all around the Muslim, when he rides the sunnah and he wraps himself up with the sunnah, he will be saved. We'll come back inshallah and we'll continue this most important issue concerning the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah make us from Ahlul Sunnah. Islam 
scientific notions in the glorious Quran are among its endless aspects that can testify for the divine nature of this noble book. These scientific notions are probably the best addressed to the people of our time. I am Zaghloul al -Najjar. Please join me in this program to discuss some aspects of the scientific notions in the glorious Quran. <laughs> Appreciate the word-to-word -word authenticity of scientific notions and proven facts mentioned in the glorious Quran 1400 years ago in Scientific Notions in the Glorious Quran every Saturday at 8 p.m. and repeat telecast at 8.30 a.m. India on Peace TV. Tawheed is not of. Whoever embarks will be delivered, and whoever refuses will be among the losers. Tawheed is the key of paradise and the only way to salvation. To attain eternal bliss, to attain never ending life, get in on the ark, hold on tight and never let go. Watch as Sheikh Salim al-Amri explains the basics of Islamic belief and worship in Back to Basics, next on Peace TV. Islam 101. Welcome back, dear respected viewers. As we've been mentioning, the importance of the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that it is the second source of legislation in Al-Islam. The first source is the Quran. The second source is the Sunnah. And they both complement each other and they harmonize with each other. Concerning the importance of the Sunnah, which Al-Imam Malik described as being like the Ark of Noah, whoever rides on it, he will be successful. And whoever abandons it, the way Noah's son abandoned his father's boat, then he's going to be destroyed and he's going to be drowned by the waves of fitting and adversity. So should a Muslim understand that we don't need the Quran or we don't need the Sunnah? La wallahi, la wallahi. The Prophet prohibited that. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, la yattaki anna ahadukum ala arikatihi yatihi amrun mimma amartu bihi fa yaqool ma wajatna fi kitab Allah akhad nabi wa ma lam najat taraknahu. Do not let any of you recline with comfort on your couch. And something from my sunnah comes to him, telling him to do this or to do that. Something I ordered him to do. Something that I prohibited him from doing. And he says, whatever we find in the Quran, we'll take it. Other than that, we're not going to take it. Rasulullah knew that there would be a group of people who call themselves the Quraniyun. The Quraniyun. There are a group of people who say, we only take the Quran and that's it. Only the Quran. We say about those people, كَذَبْتُمْ وَرَبِّ الْكَعْبَ You people are false and you're lying. I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. That the Quran tells you that you have to take the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have to remain on the Sarat al-Mustaqim. We cannot say we only take the Quran, nor can we say we're only taking the sunnah. He said about the Quran and the sunnah that they will not split from each other until the people meet Rasulullah at his fountain, Yomul Qiyamah. Another very important thing about the Sunnah, Ikhwani, another very important critical point about the Sunnah is that Rasulullah told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ala inni utitul Quran wa ma mithluhu ma'ahu. Verily, I have been given the Quran, was revealed to me by Allah. And I also was given what is similar to the Quran. And what was he referring to? He was referring to the sunnah. So the sunnah is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it is the kalam and the speech and the instructions and the how to do, which is from Rasulullah 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, we have to be from Ahlul Sunnah. We have to take the dawah, the call of the Sunnah back to Africa and back to where we come from. And we have to make sure that people who are not Muslims are exposed to the importance of the Sunnah and all of its understandings and all of its applications. Whether it is the aqidah, what we believe, and that's the most important thing. What did Rasulullah believe as it relates to Allah? Where Allah is and where Allah isn't. What did Rasulullah believe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his companions as it relates to the names of Allah and the attributes of Allah? That's from the sunnah. So we have to let people know about the importance of the sunnah from all angles and from all aspects. As it relates to Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his sunnah, the believers, the mu'minun, they are the people who, when the sunnah comes to them, they embrace the sunnah. The one who rejects the sunnah, he runs the risk of being a non-Muslim. The one who rejects the sunnah, he runs the risk of not having life and of being a non-Muslim. Ya yulladhina aminu, stajibu lillahi wa rasul, idha da'akum lima yukum. Oh, you believe. Answer the call of Allah and his messenger. When they call you and invite you to that which will give you life. The Quran will give you life. And the sunnah will give you life. Also, Allah Ta'ala told us about the destruction of the one who rejects the sunnah and how he's not considered to be a mu'min, a believer. Allah swore by himself. And Allah said, I swear by your law, ya Muhammad. They do not believe. They do not truly believe until they cause you to judge in their cases. And then they have no problem with what you judge. They have no problem with what the judgment is of the sunnah. And they totally, completely submit. Which brings us to the last point. The opposite of the sunnah as it relates to what we're mentioning now in the methodology that's correct is al-bid'ah, the innovation in the religion. Introducing things in the religion that are not from the deen, they're not from the religion. The sunnah is doing what's correct. The bid'ah is doing what's incorrect. Like celebrating the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-milad al-nabawi, coming together and making the dhikr, that strange, hua, 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 hua. Where did that come from in our religion? When you ask the person as a revert, ya akhi, ya ammi, oh uncle, my respected elder, I want to do what you're doing. But before I do it, I want to know where's the proof of it. He says to me, you don't love Rasulullah. Is that the way we have intellectual, scholastic discussions that you become upset when you can't prove something is from al-Islam, you become upset with someone? No, we have to be able to prove what is from the religion by the religion, by the Quran and the Sunnah. If you can't prove that, then you are falling into an innovation like the taqlid al-a'ma, the blind following that the Muslims have of the imams of the madhab, the leaders of their fiqh methodology. So I only take what Imam Malik says, and that's it. That is an innovation and something that Imam Malik was against. So there are many innovations that have been introduced in the religion and they are against the sunnah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will free himself from those people who made those innovations, yawmul qiyama, and he used to say to us, iyakum wa muhdathatil umur, fa inna kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa kullu bid'atin dalala wa kullu dalalatin finnar. O Ummah of al-Islam, Muslims, beware of the newly invented matters in the religion. As for a watch, as for a car, as for a microphone, as for the camera, as for the studio, as for the table like this, that's not from the deen. No problem. Beware of innovations in the religion. For verily, every innovation is going astray. And every going astray leads to the hellfire. If it's from the religion, you should be able to prove it. And celebrating the birth of the Rasul is not from the deen. Celebrating Mother's Day is not from the deen. Father's Day, not from the deen. Easter, Christmas, not from the deen. All of that are innovations in the religion and the Muslims should avoid them. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, give the opportunity to some of our brothers and our guest, Nick, who's coming ever so closer to Al-Islam. Ever so closer to Al-Islam, inshallah. Anyone have any questions? Fadl ya akhi, Saleh. What is the difference between the Sunnah and the prophetic tradition, I mean the Hadith? What is the difference between the Sunnah and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. What is the difference? The sunnah can be the hadith and the hadith can be the sunnah as well. 
They can be muturadifatan. They can be synonyms for each other. But usually the hadith is the actual statement, the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, where he said a particular thing. He ordered with a particular thing, prohibited a particular thing. Whereas the sunnah can also be his description. The sunnah can be other than that. And we have a segment dealing with the hadith in detail as well so that it will be clarified. And that's when we're going to use the board, inshallah, when we're dealing with the hadith and the metan and the senate, and we're dealing with the rawi or the narrator of the hadith, inshallah ta'ala. Any more questions, shabab? Any more questions? Akhi, sorry. Just you mentioned the, the celebration of birthday of Prophet. And I cannot see something wrong here because, for example, we are doing our sunnah, we are doing our fard. And what's wrong if we'll do extra, for example, like celebrate the... Good question, Akhi Saradar. But we don't have enough time to deal with it at this particular time. Shout